recording. For those who uh, are listening to this recording, I forgot to pray, so remember to pray before you watch this study. And we're going to do uh, a review, a very brief review, because um, we're going to go into more detail. So what we're studying in this study is, it's basically uh, all of the studies that led to July 18th, 2020, for an attack by Islam upon Nashville that's going to occur on that date. And we call it the, the prophecies of the two Josiahs, or the prophecies of Josiahs, the prophecies of Josiah, because there are two. There's the prophecy that Ezekiel uses, uh, which is what we're mostly going to be focusing on in this first part. And later on, we'll move to the prophecy of Josiah Litch, which is Revelation 9. So we have Ezekiel in, Reve in Ezekiel 4, verse 4 to 6 specifically, where he references a 390-year period and a 40-year period that ties to the prophecy of Josiah, both at, at its beginning and its end. And then in Revelation 9, we have uh, Josiah Litch. Uh, both of these prophecies have similar ways in which they're structured. So Josiah Litch's prophecy uses a symbol of the 26th day of the fourth month, which we're going to study into detail. And uh, Ezekiel uses a symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month. And, and we're going to be studying that at the present time. We're going to be looking at that. We did do an overview of the prophecy to some degree, um, but we left out a lot of detail. And in order to present something to someone, you need to understand it well. I mean, you could sort of remember the salient points and bring those out and not necessarily understand all the arguments. But if somebody that you're studying with has questions, you're going to need to be able to answer those questions. So it's now the more you practice presenting this, uh, the better you're going to get at it. And just because when you're studying with somebody and you're sharing some truth, you may not have the answers there at that moment. Uh, but you can always tell people that you don't know or you, you can't remember uh, some detail, but that you can share it with them in, uh, at a later time. Now, I think right now, a lot of the ways that we're going to be sharing with people is going to be online, uh, through emails, uh, through different chat groups. Uh, there's not a lot of contact we have with people that we can spend a lot of time doing this one-on-one. -on -one. But I, I encourage people to try to, to share this in various ways. Now, I, I have designed these studies to go simply uh, so that Levites could join in. I don't see many, many people that haven't already understood parts of this message who are, are watching the live stream. Uh, but I do know that people are watching these videos online. So some people don't have the time to be here, but as I put them on my website, uh, we're getting views on those and people seem to be watching them because I can look at the analytics and I can see, are people just looking at it or are they actually watching through it? And it seems like a lot of people are watching through the videos. Now, maybe some of us who are actually studying these things uh, and, and participating, but just missing the odd one. So when we look at the chrono chronology of Ezekiel, I, we went through a, a paper called Reconciling Ezekiel's Chronology. And the issue there in the chronology of Ezekiel is that Ezekiel's uh, chronology does not seem to work. That is, if you look at the prophecies of Jeremiah and you look at his chronology and you look at Ezekiel's, there are these apparent contradictions. And we spent some time uh, going through those contradictions. So to look at, at this, I'm just going to quickly review this paper. And the real issue uh, came, or at least the one that, that readily comes to mind, has to do with the years of the captivity. So when you look at the years of the captivity as expressed in uh, Ezekiel 40 verse 1, they don't appear to line up properly. So the, the years of the captivity, we have um, 
the 25th year of the captivity and the 14th year since the city was smitten. And that's, so it's the 25th year of the captivity and the 14th year, and you can line those up together. When you do that, it appears that the first year is the 12th year where we're told that it's the 11th year. And we worked through this and people commented that this was very, very helpful. One is when I drew it up and tried to, to, to write it on the board, um, I, I always do it. I always make the same mistake. And, but that's always fortuitous or at least providential in that once I correct the mistake in doing the counting, uh, people then can see uh, for themselves where the problem lies. So people like the fact that I made a mistake and then worked through it with you. So that was really useful. So you need to watch that video if you want to understand it fully. Now, we also dealt with the idea of the siege. And so we know that Ezekiel is predicting the siege in Ezekiel 4, verse 4 to 6. And we're going to look at that in more detail. Um, because what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the literal 390 days and 40 days. So that, that part we, we did touch on. And we did touch, so we touched on everything, but I don't think it would be clear in everybody's mind. So we're going to look at, at that a bit more in detail. But the idea is that the siege begins on the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year, it says, which would be the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign. So it doesn't say the ninth year of the captivity. So when he's counting the years of the captivity, he tells you. But when he's not using the years of the captivity, and when he's using the years of the captivity, he's going fall to fall because he's counting it as if uh, Jehoiachin was still reigning. And Jehoiachin's reign was fall to fall. But Zedekiah, who was put on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar, has the same reignal count, the same reignal year count, that is, he starts in the spring just as Nebuchadnezzar does. So he goes back to the original way it was with the kings of Judah prior to Manasseh. So, and we, we spent a bit of time showing how if you're doing something as the ninth year or the tenth year, it can make a lot of difference. So if you look at this chart here, if the siege begins in the ninth year, um, of, and that's in the 10th day of the 10th month, but it ends in the 11th year. If I'm going uh, spring to spring, that makes a, a siege of about a year and a half. But if I'm going on a fall to fall calendar, the siege becomes uh, a whole year longer. So it's two and a half year siege. Um, if any of you studied the Sabbath school quarterly uh, when they did the book of Jeremiah uh, a couple of years back, uh, the Adventist quarterly used a two and a half year siege. So they were using a, a fall to fall calendar for both Zedekiah and the years of the captivity. Most Adventist scholars actually choose a spring to spring calendar for Zedekiah. And, and it creates quite a different uh, chronology for Ezekiel. So what, what we have done is we've put together both of those. So we know that there are two different calendars being used. Uh, the, the book of Ezekiel uses a fall to fall calendar for the captivity and a spring to spring calendar for Zedekiah's reign. It doesn't make difference for most dates but the ones that it does make a difference for are the ones that occur between this from the seventh to the twelfth month. It causes a discrepancy of a year. So I'm not going to go through the detail of that because we did work through it last time. But it's it's one of those problems that uh, nobody had ever resolved until we resolved it in 2016. So we reconcile that, the 25th year with the 11th year. Um, the other thing that ends up happening is uh, looking at the, the period of time where the start, where he's counting the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity, and he's counting the 30th year 
from an unnamed event. So we looked at that a little bit in detail, uh, a little bit in detail, but not completely in detail. There's still more details to bring out. Uh, in this paper though, I'm focusing upon, in this paper that we studied last week, I focused upon the chronology, but not so much the prophecies. And so when we start to look at the prophecies, we can start to understand uh, those details a little bit more. So I would recommend that people read over this paper on reconciling Ezekiel's chronology. A lot of people find it's a fairly simple paper to understand compared to most of my papers. Um, I deal with Jehoiakim's reign and, and so forth. There's a lot of little details in there that I didn't really bring out. Uh, some information that would just be too much to go through in a video like this. And um, I, didn't, I didn't actually address some of the discrepancies in 597, but we're going to look at those a little bit more in detail. So when Jehoiachin was taken captive, um, I'm going to look at that. That's in this paper. I'm going to look at that as well. And um, so the complete chronology, once we, we look at this, uh, this is all the chronology of all of his visions. Uh, there is actually uh, 13 different dates that are mentioned in Ezekiel. Uh, that he has visions that are dated, but there are other dates that are on here uh, referencing Josiah's Passover, for instance. And of course, the date for the destruction of Jerusalem and the, is not mentioned in Ezekiel, though the date of the siege is. And I've also refined my dates a little bit in that when I look at the end of the siege in 586, and you can see it here in the middle, the end of the siege says July 19th, 586, the ninth day of the fourth month in the 11th year of Zedekiah. I've refined that to be July 18th because I've come to the conclusion that Ezekiel is using the Babylonian calendar. Now I have here the chronology of Ezekiel laid out, but this needs to be corrected to compensate for the Babylonian calendar. And we did spend a bit of time going through um, this. And when you look at 586, for those who, uh, we're, we have the reign of Nebuchadnezzar here, and we're going to have the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar as being 586. And in the 19th year, um, the first day of the first month is April 13th. Now, the biblical calendar will always go 3029, 3029, 3029 from the first day of the first month until the 10th day of the seventh month, so that the 10th day of the seventh month is always, um, the 10th day of the seventh month is always 187 days from when the, the year began on, at sunset on the, at, at the last day of the previous year. So when we look at this calendar here and you go through, there's the first month is April 13th, the fifth month starts on March, March, uh, March, May 12th. The third month starts on June 11th. And the fourth month starts on July 10th. So July 10th would be the fourth day of the first month. And so you would count uh, July 10th would be 1, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 would be the ninth day of the fourth month. So July 18th would be the day that the walls of Jerusalem fell. And August 18th would still be the date for the destruction of the temple on the 10th day of the fifth month. So we have these two different symbols, the ninth day of the fourth month for the walls falling and the 10th day of the fifth month uh, for the destruction of the temple. The destruction of Jerusalem occurs in that period of three days, the temple on the 10th day is destroyed. So that's just a, a little bit of a review of what we covered. But now we're going to look at uh, Josiah Lich's uh, literal. So I'm gonna unshare here. Stop sharing that. So we're gonna look at, um, and I'm gonna write this out. I do have charts of it but I find it's much more useful, much easier to follow when I write this out. 
so we're gonna we're addressing Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 4 to 6 and Ezekiel is told to lie on his left side for 390 days and his right side for 40 days now we established that Ezekiel begins to prophesy on the fifth day of the fourth month and this is in the year 592 and this is this date is the uh, the fifth year of the captivity it's also the 30th year of the jubilee cycle so we, we did spend a bit of time <clears throat> establishing that as well so in the fifth year of the captivity on the fifth day of the fourth month he has his first vision but he references he references this fifth year now this is his personal captivity so ezekiel was carried away captive into babylon just as jehoiachin was now jehoiachin he's going to be put in prison where he's going to stay there for 36 years so ezekiel is here in babylon and he has his first vision and now this date is july 21st. So July 21st, of course, in 1844, is the fifth day of the fourth month. Now, for people not familiar with the biblical calendar, they would just think, oh, the fifth day of the fourth month must always be July 21st. But that's not the case. Uh, the fifth day of the fourth month can float around, just like Easter does, because this is based upon a lunar calendar where our calendar, our months are not based upon the moon. So July 21st, that it happens to be the same date in Millerite history. So I'm gonna draw this up here. So you got the fifth day of the fourth month. And this is July 21st, 1844. And this is what we call midnight because between the first day of the first month, which is in this year, 1844, is April 19th. The same is true in 592 BC. The first day of the first month is April 19th. Now, this is a Gregorian calendar and this is a Julian calendar, but in this history, we use Julian dates. And in Millerite history, of course, we know that this is the 10th day of the seventh month, and that's October 22. And we know that Ezekiel's last recorded vision in Ezekiel 40, verse 1, is the 10th day of the seventh month. And it's also October 22, in that in this year, which is uh, 573 BC, just as in 592 BC, the first day of the first month is April 19th. Now, these are 19 years apart, and that's a characteristic of the lunar solar calendar that the Assyrians and Babylonians and Jews and many, many people in the ancient times noticed is that every 19 years, uh, you come back to the same date. Now, or at least the same relationship to the sun, to the solar year, um, because they add, in a period of 19 years, they add seven leap years or, or a, a 13th month so every two or three years they have a 13th month and so when they do that they notice that this repeats this and it's called the metonic cycle named after a greek mathematician meton who formalized the understanding of of that so so this period of time 19 years is obviously fortuitous or providential i should use that word instead god has has done this and he has made it that July 21st, is mid, which is midnight in 1844, is where Ezekiel begins to prophesy. And his prophesy, uh, the last one recorded in the book, is October 22nd, the 10th day of the seventh month. So you can see that Ezekiel and Samuel Snow, who presents at Boston, where he says that it's midnight, that it's midway now White calls this midway but it was exactly midway 
and the number of days is 94 between here and here. Um, I believe it depends how you count it. You count it two ways. But if you take 94, it's the ninth ninth day of the fourth month uh, when the walls of Jerusalem come down. So you can count it that it's 94, but you're counting some of the dates twice. Um, but anyway, when we when we get back here to Ezekiel, we know that he's going to be predicting uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. So he's not predicting this event specifically because this is just a symbol, but he's going to be uh, predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. But his main goal is to predict the siege. And so we're going to look at the literal uh, days and see how they point to the date of the siege. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that this, this has been hidden uh, from us for, well, ever since Ezekiel wrote, so 2,500 years. Uh, when Ezekiel wrote, he, he wrote some things down that people could not understand. They couldn't unravel them. And there was lots of different opinions about this. As time went on, uh, we, well, one is we lost the knowledge of the chronology, um, and man started to bury it with their tradition. So all the scholars were basically barking up the wrong tree when it came to try to understand this, because they had the wrong chronology, and they didn't, and they didn't have the time, maybe, and the tools to actually examine it clearly. So we have those resources now, but there's so many false concepts that we have that nobody was able to put it all together. Now, there are scholars who will recognize that this is July 21st and that the last date in Ezekiel is October 22nd, and they will recognize that it's the 10th day of the seventh month and the fifth day of the fourth month, but they don't necessarily know about Millerite history, so that doesn't mean much to them. They don't realize that Millerite history, that the fifth day of the fourth month is halfway between the first disappointment and the great disappointment. So they just don't have that knowledge, and because that, they don't have that knowledge, they don't notice it. Uh, it's not as it's not significant significant to them. So we have um, here in Ezekiel that he's he's going to be here, and we're going to look at this uh, scripture. Now I do have uh, some other notes that we can look at. Uh, these notes are. Uh, an overview of July 18th is the name of the paper, and it's going to be on the July 18th, 2020 website. So it's, uh, it's sort of a simplified, not simple enough, I guess, because uh, Clayton was here uh, last week and he was saying we need to have a simpler explanation. Uh, we need to explain our reasons in a very concise way. And I thought I had done it with this paper, but I guess it wasn't uh, really sufficient. But maybe, you know, and, and we, we had a discussion regarding it. One is people are going to be convinced, not because we have really, really good arguments necessarily, uh, but because the Holy Spirit impresses them. And so I think it's important that, uh, you know, we write things down in different ways. Different minds work differently. Some people are convinced by different types of evidences. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so I'm just going to read some of this here. Um, what are the reasons we have for saying that Nashville will experience a nuclear attack on July 18th? I guess I should share the screen. And I can look at it up there. And... <clears throat> so what are the reasons we have for saying that Nashville will experience a nuclear attack on July 18, 2020? Well, the complete answer is detailed and extensive. We will try to answer this question in as simple a manner as possible. To do so, we give a brief overview of the prophecy of Ezekiel in regard to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC and 70 AD. We will look at the prophecy of Revelation 9 and how it was fulfilled by Islam, and then we will look at how both of these prophecies are related. Lastly, we will address Millerite history, seeing how present events parallel events in 1844 and whether they lead. 
The first evidence comes from the book of Ezekiel, written during the Babylonian captivity and the period under which Jerusalem was destroyed. Ezekiel prophesied from July 21st, 592, until April 16th, 570 BC. So I mentioned that his last vision in his book that's recorded is in 40 verse 1. That's the last date you have. But he actually did have one vision that was later, but it's written earlier in the book. And, and that vision uh, relates to Egypt. And it's, it's on the first day of the first month, which, of course, is significant. Uh, but that date is um, July 21st, 592 B.C., I believe. Actually, I thought it was July 16th. So, uh, no, it's April 16th. That's where the 16th comes in. So, oh, no, never mind. It's April 16th. I'm getting, I'm reading this wrong. Yeah, so from July 21st to April 16th, 570 B.C. So that's uh, about two and a half years later after Ezekiel 40, verse 1. He was taken captive along with Jehoiachin and carried to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar's army at, with the fall of Jerusalem in the spring of 597 BC. So we're actually going to look at this in a little bit more detail than this paper has, because we, we want to understand uh, this part of the chronology. It's an important part. Um, we're not going to do it right away, though, but we will look at it at some point. In fact, Ezekiel's dates. Ezekiel dates some of his prophecies from the start of his cap this captivity. So when he, he's referencing the, the year of the captivity, he's referring back to his own captivity. He also rever refers back to the 18th year of the reign of King Josiah. It is from this year in which Josiah has a Passover after finding the lost book of the law that Ezekiel begins his jubilee cycle. So Ezekiel has this jubilee cycle, which is just specific to his book. We wouldn't confuse it with uh, the other jubilee cycles that exist. And so in, in establishing this, I'm, I'm going to show this to someone. I want them at least to understand where it starts, where we're counting, and to understand this basic chronology. So here in this paper, I just review that beginning and start of Ezekiel's vision. Now, maybe, maybe we don't need to do that. Um, I always just feel that I need to. So maybe part of the problem that I have in presenting this is I present all these little details that I think are so important, uh, but to others, there may be, they don't mean as much. And so you can probably leave them out. I have this little chart where uh, I show Josiah's Passover. And, and this part is important in understanding the, the time prophecy itself. And, which is May 4th, 622 BC. Uh, we see Jehoahaz reigns for a while, then Jehoiakim, and then Jehoiachin from December 9th to March 16th, 597 BC. Then Ezekiel's first vision um, is in the reign of Zedekiah, and that's July 21st, 592. The fall of Jerusalem, that's when the, the walls come down, not the city being destroyed, is July 18th, 586 BC. And then Ezekiel's last vision, October 22nd, 573 BC. So in Ezekiel's prophecy, uh, as we're, we're going to look at this, um, the literal part of it, uh, I'm just going to read this here. I guess it, it probably says it a little bit better. It kind of sets the scene. The purpose of Ezekiel prophesying is to warn God's people of the coming siege and destruction of Jerusalem. This warning had already been given by Jeremiah, but Ezekiel gives us precise chronological details as to when this destruction will occur. In an elaborate, acted-out prophecy, Ezekiel predicts the year of the start of the siege. More than this, Ezekiel also has hidden in his prophecy the actual date for the destruction of the city and the sanctuary in both 586 BC and 70 AD. And this is a really important point that, that we're going we're gonna to examine in understanding how Ezekiel is not just predicting 586 BC, he's predicting 70 AD. There are three parts to Ezekiel's prophecy. The first is the depiction of the siege of Jerusalem. He draws a picture of Jerusalem on a tile and makes models of a fort, a mount, and, a battering, ra and battering rams to portray the siege. The second is that Ezekiel is asked to lie upon his left side for 390 days, and then on his right side for 40 days, while facing the depiction of the siege. 
The literal days represent periods of 390 years and 40 years for the iniquity of Israel and Judah, respectively. 390 years begins with the prophecy of Josiah in 977 BC, as found in 1 Kings 13, verse 1 to 5. And the 40 years begins with its fulfillment in 627 BC, with its fulfillment found in 2 Kings 23, 15 to 18. Both periods end together with the commencement of the siege that occurs on the 10th day of the 10th month in the ninth year of Zedekiah, some 1629 days from the giving of Ezekiel's prophecy. The third part of the prophecy, which we will ignore here, even though there are many interesting details, addresses the conditions of the siege and the bread and the water that Ezekiel prepares for himself for the whole period of 430 days that he lies facing the siege. So one of the things Ezekiel does is he has to, he has a certain amount of water he has to drink and a certain amount of food that he has to eat. So this would be like somebody in a siege who has a limited supply of water and food, so it's, it's being rationed. And so he does this to illustrate this. Now, Ezekiel, and this, this idea is not well understood um, because we know when Ezekiel is doing these acted out prophecies that when he is doing that, he is representing uh, in symbolic ways uh, what's going to happen to the people. And Ezekiel, his life becomes a symbol. Things that happen to him uh, become symbolic of what's going to happen to God's people. But this is true of other prophets as well. So for instance, when um, uh, in, in the book of Revelation, John asks questions, uh, he's asking questions as, as playing a role for the time that he's, he's depicting. And, and we see this in other places as well. So a prophet represents uh, more than just him. He, he's symbolic himself. He becomes part of the prophecy. In Ezekiel, this is really clear. It's not as clear in other places. But when you, when you recognize it, you see how it applies. So here uh, we have this prophecy. So I drew it out for people but we're going to draw this out ourselves and, and trying to understand the, so we're going to look at the literal days, but we're just going to review this prophecy as far as uh, what he's prophesying. So we know that he's here and he's going to be predicting something in the future. So I'm going to change this, erase this. So let's put Ezekiel here. So here he is on the fifth day of the fourth month in uh, 592 BC. And this date is July. 21st. We call this midnight if we want. So he's here representing Samuel Snow. He's representing uh, the midnight cry. So he's at midnight and the midnight cry was given July 21st, 1844. And he's going to have a vision here. That's his first vision. And that first vision includes everything from chapter one to the end of chapter seven. In chapter 8, verse 1, he's going to have his second vision. Now, so when we get to chapter 4, he's still here in this vision. He's still, in, and that happens in one day, even though there's time that passes by in the vision itself, it doesn't pass by in reality. So he's carried away and, and to Tel Aviv and Babylon, and he sits there astonished for seven days. That's in vision. It's not in reality. Now, in this vision, we're going to examine in detail here, which I'm going to put below here, we're going to examine uh, the number of days. So we're going to have him over here. So this is on the fifth day of the fourth month in July 21st. And we're going to examine those. 
But the main thing that we know is that this goes back to the prophecy of Josiah. So he's here, and he's now going to reference a prophecy that goes back to 977 BC. So this prophecy here, 977 BC, is given on the 15th day of the eighth month. So it's a detail I, I leave out um, in trying to explain in the paper because I don't want people to be confused by it um, because it just becomes a lot of symbols. Now, to us, this is extremely re relevant. So we're going to go uh, back to um, this sh the shared screen here, and we're going to look at these verses. So in 1 Kings chapter 13, and, and we did look at this a little bit last time, and if you go to chapter 12, actually, just to the end of chapter 12, um, it says of Jeroboam in verse 29, and he set up one in Bethel, so he made gold calves, I guess, starting on verse 28, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and one he put in Dan. So the one in Bethel is in the south, and the one in Dan is in the far north. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi, and Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, in the fifteenth day of the month, like unto a feast that is in Judah, the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so he did in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah. So if you don't read uh, chapter uh, 12, you may not recognize that he's actually there on the 15th day of the eighth month offering on this altar. Uh, because the chapter divisions are added later. So originally there would be no, be no division. So we know that this is when it occurs. And it mentions this date twice. And the doubling is a symbol of the midnight cry. And also the 15th day of the eighth month, because we know in 1844 that it was on August 15th, so that's the eighth month, the 15th day, that the midnight cry was empowered at Exeter. So, and most Adventists know about Ex Exeter. They're going to know about that event to some degree. They might remember the story of Samuel Snow riding up on a horse. It's also in the movie The Midnight Cry. Though in reality, there was 5,000 people present uh, in Exeter. They have the great tent there. Um, but in the movie, it's a few people standing in the woods, if you've seen that new movie called The Midnight Cry. Obviously, they didn't have the money, though they probably could have used some CGI effects to create a big crowd of people if they really wanted to, but it probably would have cost a lot. I'm not sure how much it costs to do those things. So you don't get the, the, the impact that that had. And from that meeting, of course, the seventh month movement really began where people said, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. But we know there's Boston where he first declared it was midnight and then August 15th. And we're going to see how important those symbols are as we look at this prophecy. And, and that's the thing that's amazing. When we, when we start to look at this prophecy, we see that all these symbols of Millerite history come into play. And, and we might take it for granted a little bit if we've been studying this message for a while, but this is an extremely powerful witness uh, when people are, are presented with this. When you present this to Seventh-day Adventists and they see um, these dates, um, it really impresses them if, if they're open. Now, some will never want to hear it, but anybody who's searching for truth and, and can follow what you're presenting, they can't help but be impressed by it because it's so amazing that this actually occurs 
in this, in this prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 4. So I think we kind of take it for granted uh, that, this, that this occurs. But as we look at the literal days, we'll start to realize that this is, is no way that this is, occurs by chance in the book of Ezekiel. So it's one of those things that can catch people. Um, that they will just all of a sudden become interested when you present these things. It, it's extremely convincing uh, prophecy once it's laid out. Now I'm taking a little bit more time than I might if I'm presenting it, depending whom I'm presenting it to, really to try to explain these points because you need to have them in your mind. Now, you're gonna to have to wanna to understand them for yourself if you want to believe that they're true because uh, if you believe that they're true, to con because you could just believe it because you've heard it, but you need to examine it. And so that's why we need to go through these details. So anyway, we get to chapter 13. It says, behold, a man of God came uh, God out of Judah by, came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. So this is in the southern part. And Jer Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O oh, altar, altar. Again, we have a doubling. Thus saith the Lord, behold, the child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And, and you can read on to verse 5. We're going to leave that part out about the altar uh, uh, being rent. Um, there's just a lot of detail there. But sometimes you may want to, to go through more of the story um, with people. Sometimes you may want to do less of it, depending on how much time you have. So we can see that it's, it's here that Jeroboam does this. Now, as far as dating it, um, you know, that's a question where people could maybe not fully understand it. But we know that there's a th prophecy of 390 days. And if I go from, uh, you know, if I go back from here, obviously I can't be going back from here 390 days. And so when we look at Ezekiel, we know he's wow. predicting the siege. And so we can show that the siege occurred on the 10th day of the 10th month. Can you stop sharing? Stop. Stop sharing, please. Okay, sorry. I always do that. Okay, so on the 10th day of the 10th month, uh, Jeroboam, or not Jeroboam, Ezekiel is predicting this siege. And this is when the siege begins. And we're going to look at that. So he's predicting this event. And so we know, if we know this event, we should be able to know the year for this event. Because he has to be presenting something that we can go back and look at in time. Now, the siege began in 587 on the 10th day of the 10th month. So this was uh, January 5th or 6th. So it's just at the beginning of 587 that this siege begins. We're going to look at that. But we can see that if we, if we go back from the start of the siege, we come to this year 977. So in tying this event together, I have to know that the kingdom was divided in 977. And I do this in other books, where or other um, papers, and also in other presentations, where I lay out this chronology and show that this is when the kingdom was divided in 977. And it was earlier in the year. It wasn't here, because this, this date on our calendar, on the Julian calendar, would have been November 22nd. So, um, so we know that at the beginning of the year, in 977, Solomon had died, uh, Rehoboam was put on the throne, and Jeroboam then, uh, with northern Israel, rebelled. He became the king of northern Israel. And then he had to build the golden calves, and then he had to uh, offer on the altar. And this would be the first time that he's offering on the altar uh, on the 15th day of the eighth month. So this would have been the first time. So he had just set this up. This counterfeit uh, day of worship, it would be like a counterfeit day of atonement, and he's now going to offer on this altar, and that's when the prophecy of Josiah is going to be given. 
So we can count the 390 years here. Um, now in establishing that, people could argue, uh, chronology is the easiest thing to argue against. Uh, and that's one of the problems I had when I dealt with the 2520 and I started studying it. Um, people could easily argue against it. They could just say, well, you know, your dates are incorrect. Um, so, because they will find some place somewhere where somebody questions the date or some other person has a different date. Well, the question then really becomes, how do you prove uh, chronology? And, and I think the only way that you can prove it is through prophecy. Now, of course, it has to be based on reality. I can't just simply say, well, I like this prophecy and this chronology needs to fit. We also have to show that there's no contradictions in God's word and that there's no contradiction from any verifiable fact. So when somebody has a chronology uh, that contradicts um, historical evidence that we can verify through uh, eclipses of the moon and so forth, to me, that's a very difficult way to try to, to, to work and say, well, I'm just going to accept what the Bible says, but I'm not going to accept what reality says. Um, now, we may have an idea that the Bible says something, but we may not be correct. So truth has to align with reality. And so some people don't like that. They think I'm a too scientific. They, they want to believe like 538, it says 538 on the charts. For the fall of Babylon, I argue, argue that it's on October 13th, 539. They say, well, that doesn't agree. Of course it does, because you have to understand the calendars, but they don't like that because they say I'm dependent upon science. Uh, but science, there is a true science. A true science agrees with God's word. So the point is somebody could argue against 977 by taking Edwin Thiel's dates and just say, well, it wasn't, you know, it was way before that, you know, 45 years uh, or later, actually, so that you would have had uh, the kingdom divided. So I, I can't remember the dates that they give, but I think it's uh, um, like nine, uh, 940 something BC that they give for the dividing of the kingdom. So that becomes a problem. And, and the same with the Exodus. They're going to have earlier dates for the Exodus. They're not going to have the Exodus in 1533. They're going to have it in 1441, which is almost 100 years difference. Um, so this, these are the types of problems that you have. So anybody can just cut down uh, a date. The more difficult task is actually to, to demonstrate the correct date. And, and that's the thing that people aren't able to do. Anybody can just question 457 BC, for instance. Um, but how do you establish uh, the correct date? So, so we have to be careful when we see how people tend to um, criticize these things. We're, we're, there are ways in which we can convince them uh, if they are open by getting them to see that this is the way that the Bible fits things together. And so that's what you're going to see with this prophecy. Um, now, there's other parts of it that, you know, we're going to leave out here. Obviously, I'm not going to establish 977 here. I don't have the time to do that, but I could do it in other ways. And uh, the simplest way to do it is to take the 70 years captivity and the 490 years of transgression. That's how I originally arrived at 977. But we can also just add up all the reigns of the kings of Judah and take out the two-year co-regency of uh, Jehoshaphat and Jehoram, and you get 391 years and a half days uh, to the end of, uh, or 391 and a half years to the end of Zedekiah's reign, and you count back, and it brings you to uh, the spring of 977 BC. So that's, there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. The thing is, every single way that we do it agrees with scripture. Uh, where people have other theories, they're going to run into contradictions with scripture and with reality. So, so we have this 390 years here. And that's, that's where I started. Actually, back in 2014, I'd established that there was 390 years here and that it ends with the siege. And then I had determined then that the 40 years would lie here 
and also end with the siege. Now, in doing that, we, we just add 40 years to 587, and you get 627. So 627 BC becomes the fulfillment. So this is the prophecy, and this is the fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, I kind of skipped a step there. So I know that this event here is predicting this. What I didn't have was what the event was in here. I had 627, and I knew 627 was the 13th year of uh, jo uh, Josiah. I also know it's the year in which uh, Jeremiah began his ministry, but I don't have an explicit text that tells me anything about this as far as chronologically, at least at first I didn't think that I did. So I missed it. But what I ended up doing when I looked at uh, the prophecy here, dealing with the prophecy of Josiah, I then looked at its fulfillment and tried to figure out the date for that. And so that's what we're going to do now is look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 23. And we did look at this before, 2 Kings chapter 23. And this starts on verse 15. And it says, Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both that altar and the high place he break down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he espied the sepulchers that were there on the, in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers. I guess I can just share the screen so you can see the verses. Um, in verse 16, and, and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed. And I'm not showing the right thing. Just showing you that. So let's try this again. Let's do that. Okay, there we go. So we can read this over again. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son, son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made, both the altar and the high place he break down. So this is talking about Josiah. And burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount, and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it, according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed who proclaimed these words. So, when we look at uh, the fulfillment of this prophecy, we can see that it's fulfilled, but to date it is, is part of the problem. Now, if you read in this chapter, you will find that this chapter is rever referring to events in the 18th year of Jos uh, Josiah's reign. So this is when he has his Passover. Now, we can, we can then reference this, though, to Second Chronicles, and it says in verse or chapter 24 in Second Chronicles, well, no, it's not 24. That's not the one I want. I want 34. 34. 34. I knew it was four. <laughs> so Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one in 30 years. So he reigned for 31 years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves, and carved images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence, and the images that were on high above them. And he cut down the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And he brake in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali with their mattocks round about. So we can see that he did this not just in uh, Jerusalem, but he also did it in the land of Israel. So he went throughout all of Israel and he tore down these altars. 
Now, the, the years that are given here for this, as it says, in the 12th year of his reign. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly when in the 12th year of his reign that he does this. So the 12th year of his reign, if we're going to go here, it would start because his reign is going fall to fall. Um, the King Josiah's reign is in this history. Now, I put 627 is 40 years before uh, the siege of Jerusalem begins. Now, you can look on the year in our calendar. This is in the very beginning of 587. Um, but it would really be part of the year that we might call, uh, if you were going spring to spring, you would see this as fitting uh, part of the year 588, right? Um, it's the 10th day of the 10th month. So 587, even though it's in 587, it's... So in 587 um, here, and we might line up 627, we can see just on our calendar, it, it works as 40 years. But we know that it's, it's not really about the specific time within the year, it's about the specific year. And this is a spring to spring count of a year, but Josiah counted his reigns fall to fall. So I'm not gonna work out the details right now, but I have worked out the details. And so this 13th year of his reign uh, would have began in the fall of 628 and went to the fall of 627. So when I put 627, it says in the 13th year, but it could have been, it could have been earlier, it could have been 628 technically. So we just don't know exactly when that uh, 13th year began. But in the 12th year, he began to do it in, Ju in Judah and Jerusalem. And then he's going to move, as time goes on, further on. So we have the fulfillment of this prophecy. We can't date it precisely. And over here, we have this 390 years. And you can see this is towards the end of 977, where this is at the beginning of 587. But of course, this is all connected to events that happen within a year. So it's not about finding, you know, I mean, it would be nice if everything was neat and clean and we had on the 15th day of the eighth month and it was the 15th day of the eighth month or something that happened here and you would see it's exactly five, 390 years. But in this prophecy here, it doesn't have to be exact to the date because that's not the nature of the prophecy. What's, what's important is the years, but also the symbolic dates that show up. So, so this symbolic date here obviously you're not going to have the siege start on that same date. That wouldn't make sense because we need these symbols for these different dates. So the 390 years, I'm kind of maybe belaboring the point a little bit, but I'm, I'm trying to point out that people could argue against this, that it's not as precise as they would like. Maybe that's just my precise nature um, to want everything to work out perfectly, which is why I work at all these details. But there's 390 years and there's 40 years. So we know that there's 350 years between the prophecy being given in 1 Kings, so that's in 1 Kings 13, verse 1 to 5. And to me, this is easier to remember because 2 Kings 23, and uh, I think it's, this one I always forget, I think it's 15 to 18. Um, so these two verses, this is the prophecy of Josiah, this is its fulfillment. But to date this, I have to go to Second Chronicles 34. And I have to go uh, further into the, you know, I have to read the first part of that. And, and then I have to make an assumption that this, this is the 13th year. But even if it was the 12th year, let's say it was a little bit earlier, and it's, um, you know, it's actually in 628, you could still argue that this is 40 years. Um, but this is within that realm of what we call 40 years. And this is 390 years. It's just not exactly to the day. That's, it's always something that bothers me, but I know that it, there's a reason why that is. Okay, so 
I hope that that point's clear. I mean, I spent a bit of time sort of establishing that there's this period of 390 years and 40 years, and they both mark the siege is what's being marked. So if you read Ezekiel 4, verse 4 to 6, and like I originally did, and I just saw the 390 years and the 40 years, I was really satisfied that I understood Ezekiel's prophecy, that he was predicting the siege. Now, we also know that he was predicting the destruction of Jerusalem, but I didn't know he was predicting the date for the destruction of Jerusalem. So um, we're going to look at that, and the way that we understand that is looking at the literal times, the literal days that he lies on his left and his right side, and the dates that are derived from that. So, we know that he started on the fifth day of the fourth month, and we can count the days. Now, a simple way to do it for me, and when I want to count these days, does anybody know in Millerite history how many days there were between July 21st, Stephen can't answer, July 21st, 1844, and August 15th, 1844. This was something that Jeff established a long time ago. So July 21st is Boston, August 15th is Exeter. How many days are there between Boston and Exeter? Anybody know? You could count it, but it's something we should know because it's, it's a symbol. Nobody knows? Can somebody count it? So there's 15 days in August, right? From, from the first day of August to the 15th. And from the 21st to the 31st of July is 10 days, so it's 25 days. Now, if you add a year to 25 days, how many days do you have? So 25 plus 365. So if he's going to start lying here on his left side, here, and he's going to lie on his left side, and he's going to finish lying on his left side, we know that this is going to be 390 days, right? And I know that if I add 25 to 365, that that's going to be 390, right? 365 days in a year plus 25. So that means this is going to be August 15th. And it's going to be one year later. So this was 592. This is going to be 591. So just these 390 days themselves give us July 21st and August 15th, a symbol of midnight and the midnight cry. So this tells us that this is not accident that he starts on July 21st and he lies on his left side for 390 days. Now, if we look at the the biblical calendar, here you have to establish the biblical calendar for each year. You have to look at the, the new moon and so forth. But, and I, I've done that, but I think the simpler way is to just look at the Babylonian calendar. So if we uh, go to uh, our papers here, so I'm going to share, and it's this one here. So we're going to look at this paper. This paper is the Babylonian calendar. And you can see I have uh, the dates. So I'm going to go back up here. So you can see we got uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And you can see 597 there on the left. And you get to 592. The first day of the first month is April 19th. And then you go to 591. And you're going to go to um, this month here. So this is going to be the fifth month. So if I want to find the date that's going to be August 15th, um, the August 15th, so I'm on the eighth month, so that's August. And the first day of, of, the, of the 
eighth month is the fifth day of August. So I'd count that as one, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And so I would find that, I'll stop sharing here. So this August 15th on the Babylonian calendar is the 11th day of the fifth month. And that's counting from here to complete, completely finish his 390 days. Now the last day that he lies on his left side is the day before that. So on August 15th, that night, he's going to begin lying on his right side. And he's going to do that for 40 days. Right? So on his right side, let's put an R here. He's going to lie on his right side for 40 days. Get rid of this. So, but the last day that he begins to lie on his left side, so the last night, is going to be on the 10th day of the fifth month. So on the 10th day of the fifth month, he's going to finish his 390 days. And then the next night, on the 15th, He's going to begin his 40 days. So this symbol here, the 10th day of the fifth month, is hidden in this literal 390 days. So we have this symbol that shows up in Ezekiel. And we have this symbol. So we have three symbols. Two of these are from Millerite history. But this one is from 586 and 70 AD. This is the symbol of the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. So we know that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed on the 10th day of the fifth month in 586. You know, so about a year and a half after uh, the walls, uh, the siege began. The walls of Jerusalem are going to be broken down 30 days before here. Um, so in this history, uh, we have this year and a half. So it depends how you count it. Literally, it's uh, from the 10th day of the 10th month to the 10th day of the 5th month. If you count the actual months here, it's 20 months on the biblical calendar based upon the moon. is the 10th day of the 10th day. On our calendar, it would be 19 uh, months. But when you go to, to the death of Zedekiah, it's 18 months. It's actually a year and a half. So, so you could count this different ways. Uh, and some of these things can become symbols. 19 be can become a symbol. 20 can become a symbol. A year and a half becomes a symbol. Now, we know this is 390 years. So we know from here to here is 391.5 years. So that symbol of 391.5 shows up. Now, when I counted the kings of Judah before I had understood this prophecy, I counted the reigns of the kings of Judah by adding them up. It's not as easy as you think because there's some things that you have to sort through. But if you just take the years and you, you take in the one co-regency that's mentioned in the Bible, it adds up to 391 and a half years. So if you go from the spring of 977 or from basically the beginning of 977 and you count 391 and a half years, it will bring you all the way to to 586 to the summer of 586 so this was intriguing when i saw 391 for the kings of judah because when i first saw it i recognized that this equaled of the 391 from josiah lich's prophecy but in that prophecy it's years and 15 days now 15 days is 0.5 months where this is 0.5 years but I noticed this even before I really understood uh, anything having to do with Josiah Lich's prophecy connected to this, um, just, just in the fact that I knew this number was significant. So I thought that was interesting. When I first figured out the kings of, of Judah being 391 and a half years, that was interesting. Then from that information, I could apply it to this prophecy.
Now we can we can divide this up a little bit more. We know that this is the end of the prophecy. We also have in here uh, 622, which is um, five years. So this is from the 13th year of Josiah to the 18th year. That's when he has his Passover. And that's when the fulfillment of this prophecy is mentioned, where it says moreover. So it's just including other things he did earlier. And so we would know that there's uh, here, there's 30 years from the Passover to here, because he mentions this is the fifth year, and this is also the 30th year. And then we know that there's another period of five years here, so it's not in proportion. So he's basically predicting the beginning of the siege five years before it happens. Now, one of the details I haven't really dealt with, but he mentions a day for a year. Now, when you read it in the King James, and it's, it's also the same when you read it in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, which I always forget the, the verse. I should memorize it. But it'll just say a day for a year day for a year. I've given you a day for the year, a day for a year. But if you read it in Hebrew, it doesn't say that. Yeah, it's in Numbers 30, no. Numbers 14, 34. Yeah, Numbers 14. Okay, so in Numbers 14, 34, and in obviously in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, we have this verse that's quoted, Ezekiel's quoting numbers, and it says a day to a year, a day to a year. That is, it doubles it. It doesn't just say, I've given you a day for a year. It actually doubles it. Now, literally, uh, it's in Hebrew, their expression is a day to a year. We would take it as a day for a year. But he's matching a day to a year. So I've given you a day to a year. But he doubles it. So, so that's a symbol of the midnight cry. And it occurs both in Ezekiel and in Numbers that it is doubled. So this is a very important point. And, you know, from Babylon is fallen is fallen is where we get this idea of this doubling. But it keeps showing up again and again in symbols that we understand to be the midnight cry. So we know that it's not just random that these doublings happen. So this idea that this is a day for a year prophecy is extremely important in the context of Adventism. because. When we use numbers, uh, 1434, and uh, Ezekiel 4, verse 4 to 6, in evangelistic series, we may, we may use these. We know about the 40 years in the wilderness is for um, the 40 days that the spies spied out the land. And so some people will argue, well, they say, well, that's not really a day for a year prophecy like you're trying to use with the 1260 or the 1335 or the 2300 days. They say, you know, you're not, you're not using it correctly because those are really a year for a day. That is, you're going to have a year for something that happens in a day. Now, of course, that doesn't really make much sense to me uh, because that's really what it is. It's uh, a day for a year is a year being given for something that happens in a day. So when we look at Ezekiel's prophecy, it's the same thing. He lies on his side for 390 days and 40 days, and those 390 days represent years. And we have the same thing in the Bible when it talks about the 1260 days. The days represent years, so they're parallel. Now, where, where the problem comes is, is if we don't know how Ezekiel's prophecy is fulfilled, we, we can't really demonstrate that this is a day for a year prophecy. We can say that, well, he's, there's all this apostasy that's gone on. And so he's matching a day now for something that's already occurred in a year. And so nobody has really sorted this out when it begins and when it ends and how to apply it. Now, what, what we sometimes imagine about a day for a year prophecy, and, and I don't know why we would do that, but we, we sort of imagine that they work like this, is that, um, God gives a prophecy, and then sometime in the future, that prophecy, the count is going to start, and then later on, we're going to have that prophecy end. But Ezekiel is using events that happened in the past, the prophecy of Josiah, 
both in its the giving of it and the fulfillment of it to count forward to the future about an event that's going to happen. And this is extremely important when you understand Revelation 9 and how we're making a prediction and even how Josiah Lynch made a prediction. Josiah made a prediction based on a day for a year prophecy. And obviously the book of Revelation was written beforehand, but that prophecy wasn't understood until Josiah Lynch came along in 1838 and then in 1840 nailed down the date of August 11th, 1840. So he did that on August 1st that he published that. So like 10 days before the prophecy was fulfilled, he now had the date for it. But also we can see that Ezekiel is predicting something in the future using these dates in the past and that we, we really have always done the same. We don't normally start to make a prediction with a prophecy until we're near the end of that prophecy. That is the light doesn't come until we pass over that ground of fulfilled prophecy. And then those, those events of prophecy reflect back upon past events. And then those past events shine light forward on our path into the future. So to me, this is an extremely important point. So as a Seventh-day Adventist, we now have with this prophecy, a very solid argument for the use of a day for a year prophecy for predicting future events, because that's exactly what Ezekiel does. But he does more than just predict the day of the siege, as, as we noted. So um, we're gonna try to finish this off in the next 10 minutes, this, this little bit here, then we're gonna cut, take a break and come back and then uh, uh, you know, finish off the rest of what I wanna show you. So I probably could do this pretty quickly. Now we know that Ezekiel has his first vision here. But he also has his second vision during this period of 40 years. So I need to, yeah, I got that right. So in here, he has his second vision. And his second vision is 8 verse 1. So Ezekiel 8 verse 1 is, of course, the four apostasies. So he sees them with the, in the temple with all the idols portrayed on the walls of the temple. He, he sees uh, the secret chambers, what goes on. What are the, the verses here? Can somebody list off what the four apostasies are? I always get them mixed up. Good with numbers, but not with other things. Um, the image of jealousy, the secret chambers, secret chambers, waiting for Tammuz, bowing down to the sun. Okay, bowing down to the sun, yes. So th those are the four things, the image of jealousy. And we can compare these to Millerite history. Um, in the four generations. Uh, we can apply them even uh, specifically to our time uh, with things that have happened within the movement. But the date here in which he has his second vision is September 7th, 591 BC. Now, does anybody know the biblical date, not Stephen, but anybody know the biblical date for this vision, this second vision of his. And this has bothered me since I was a child. So what's the, what's the biblical date for his second vision? Anybody know? I'm not sure, Theodore, but I have written in my Bible the fifth day of the sixth month. You have what? I, I have the fifth day of the sixth month. I don't know where I got that. So it's, it's in the verse itself. If you look at 8 verse 1, it'll say, oh. <laughs> next year, Fifth day of the month. Activity. Yeah, of course. The sixth. I'm half asleep. But it's the fifth day of the month. So fifth day. And that's always bothered me because even as a child, I knew, well, that should be 666, shouldn't it? I mean, it leads up to sun worship. So this should be 666. Why is it 665? Always has bothered me. Um, so... This is just something that, you know, I have recent light on, which uh, I'm not going to share at the moment. But we will share it uh, later on. So now I know why it doesn't go to the sixth day. It's very, very interesting. Now, we do know that September 7th uh, last year is when Jeff uh, created this, we, this chiasm 
uh, with September 7th, November 9th, and January 11th uh, that he's been presenting the last little while. Um, and that's why this ties into that. But the date here in our history is the sixth day of the sixth month. So in our history, it's not the sixth day of the fifth month, but it is actually the sixth day of the fifth, sixth month. But also it's in the sixth year of rebellion, which I'm going to have to show you at some point. But that's, that's all I'm going to say for now. Now, he's going to have his second vision here, and then his first third vision is going to be here a year later in 592 or 590. So this is 591. I put a two there. And this is 592, and then he's going to have his third vision. And that's where we're going to look at as we come back after a brief break. So we're going to come back to this, this third vision and finish off uh, the rest of Ezekiel as far as what happens in relationship to, to these events. So we're going to understand more fully uh, the symbolism that's in here, this being midnight, and, and trying to understand what these different symbols are. But we can also see here that this being midnight and the midnight cry is very significant. And so we're not gonna just uh, skip, skip that over. This is extremely important. Um, if you're presenting this, you have to establish to some degree Millerite history to get people to understand this. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, we'll have a prayer again uh, so everybody can get a drink of water, whatever they need to do. And then we'll come back at uh, half past, so in about five minutes or so, I'm going to get a drink of water. And then I'll be right back just, you know, if anybody has some questions. So I'm going to pause this. There you go. Just so I don't forget. <clears throat> so uh, this point is important. So somebody asked, uh, what about the 40 years that an Ellen White says that Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years? And he prophesied all up to the reign of the end of, of, of uh, uh, Zedekiah's reign here in 586. And we know he began to prophesy in the 13th year here, which is 627. Now, we don't know exactly where in the year he began, right? It could have been near the end of 627. You know, this is always the problem when you have these uh, spans of time. And, and so if we say that something's 40 years, we could mean it's actually like 39 and a half years. We could even mean it's like 40 and a half years. Sometimes, even sometimes for 41, we might say it was 40 years, depending on how we look at, at that year. So let's say I'm thinking back. You know, I'm here in, in the, let's say I'm in, in the month of December and I'm thinking back, yeah, 40 years ago, something happened. And let's say it's the year 2021, 20, you know, it's December 25th, 2021. And I'm thinking back, yeah, I remember back in um, uh, 1991, you know, 40 years ago, um, that would be, no, it'd actually be 81, 40 years ago. And I started thinking about the 40 years ago, but that 40 years ago was maybe in February of 1981. Well, you know, and I might say it's 40 years. Now, somebody could argue, well, that's not 40 years. I could even talk about my first year of university. Let's say I started in, in 1990, my first year of university. Well, then, uh, you know, I might even think, well, that was my first year. So I could count this different ways. And that's the point when it comes to saying that something's 40 years, how exactly does it have to be 40 years before we can accept that it's 40 years? Does it have to be exactly 40 years? Now, I made this argument dealing with the 70 years captivity, that the 70 years captivity uses the term to fulfill three score and seven years. And Ellen White says the complete, so it completed 70 years when Cyrus came to the throne. And so, when somebody, something's fulfilled, which is fulfilled full, and something is complete, I'm not going to have a period of 68 years fulfilling a period of 70 years. So you can, in some, some senses, be less e exact, but it depends on the language that you're using. Now, we know here that Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years. 
but you know, you could argue that maybe that 40 years was more like 41 if you counted it uh, ordinally, like in his 41st year. So it's just different ways of counting. And I know it's just uh, a problem that people have in, in when it comes to counting. There's so many different ways you can count. And so sometimes people get confused. I've had discussions with people many, many times where they were trying to count something in a way that didn't really make sense, but it made sense to them. And um, so once you know, I got them to show them how we could count that different ways, they started to realize, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. I just was counting it ordinarily um, instead of cardinally or sometimes the other way around. So let's uh, kneel for a short prayer and then we can start going through this again. Dear Father in heaven, again, we invite your spirit's presence. Please be our teacher. Help us to understand these things as we study through them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're gonna get back into this. And so when we finished, we finished off with uh, introducing this, this, this second vision, and now we're gonna have his um, third vision. Now this here uh, was referring back to this, so I'm gonna erase that. So his second vision happens on September 7th, and that fulfills an event in our history. But now we're gonna to go to his third vision. So this is the vision of Ezekiel 20, verse one is where it gives us the date. So this is gonna be on the 10th day of the fifth month. So we already have this symbol here, the last day that he begins to lie on his left side is the 10th day of the fifth month. And now we're on the 10th day of the fifth month here in Ezekiel 20, verse 1. And this date is the date that I'm, I'm going to use, that I originally used to get July 18th, 2020. I'm going to kind of go through how I came to understand that. There's some things that um, sort of got lost, by the way, little details. Uh, that once they were presented the first time, we've never really mentioned them uh, in, to any extent. So I'm going to bring up my screen again, and we're going to look at Ezekiel uh, 20, verse 1. And it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, and the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. So Ezekiel here has had the vision of chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. He's had his second vision. There's lots in that second vision. And now he's in Ezekiel 20, and he has his third vision. So these are different days. The book of Revelation was all given on one day. Ezekiel's revelations are given on different days. And, and you can give quite a lot of chapters in, in one, one day in a, in a vision. So it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. So the, now we know that in chapter eight, and I guess I should go back there, uh, he has this vision um, and if you read it at the beginning, I kind of skipped this detail. It came to pass in the sixth year, the sixth month, and the fifth day of the month. As I sat in mine house, and elders of Judah sat before me. Now notice here, they're elders of Judah. Uh, in Ezekiel 20, verse 1, they're elders of Israel. Now, Israel, as a nation, ended in 721 B.C. when Sargon's armies carried away uh, the Israelites and destroyed Samaria. So, but Ezekiel uses these terms, Israel and Judah. And he doesn't, and, and I think, you know, we, some people argue he just uses them interchangeably. 
Israel is Judah, Judah is Israel. But Judah is, of course, the southern kingdom, and Israel is the northern kingdom, historically. Um, so I think there's a particular reason why he does this. I'm not saying I know the answer to it, but I know in chapter 8, the certain elders of Judah, but in chapter 20, it's certain elders of Israel. So in here, he just says the elders of Judah in chapter 8, and certain elders. Now, I think when it comes to certain, that might be an added word. Yeah, no, that's not. So that certain. So the certain is, is um, not an added word. It's, it's certainly there. So we have this in Ezekiel 20, verse 1, the elders of Israel come. So here we have Judah, and here we have Israel. And if we think about this, he's already dealt with the prophecy where he's has 390 years. This is for Israel, and this 40 years is for Judah. So he's making a distinction between Israel and Judah here. And so Israel can refer to Judah, but the fact that he has elders of Judah and elders of Israel coming to sit before him, to talk to him, uh, now here, this is in the middle of his 40 days. This is actually 25 days in that his second vision happens, which is significant. Um, but uh, he's sitting in his house, so that means he's not lying on his right side during the day. He's just doing that at nighttime. That's one of the ways you could show that. But here, he's going to have, the, and they're coming to inquire of the Lord. Now, it doesn't say exactly why they do that, but for some reason, they want to uh, know some things. So, it says, it came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. And my screen doesn't appear to be sharing properly. Yeah. And, there it goes. and then came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye come to inquire of me? As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by thee. Wilt thou judge them, son of man? Wilt thou judge them? Cause them to know the abominations of their fathers, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that when I chose Israel, and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Jacob, and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt, when I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. In the day that I lifted up mine hand unto them, to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands, then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes. So here he's attacking this idolatry that exists. Now we know in our history that this refers to the Seventh day Adventist Church. Um, at least that's the way I interpret it. So we go through this, and what it's going to tell them, what it's going to tell us, what he tells them, is that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed because of their idolatry. And so he's going to go through this through chapter 20, and chapter 21, and chapter 22, and chapter 23. And he's going to give all kinds of illustrations uh, showing that uh, they basically have no hope as you know, in regard to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And then when you get to chapter 24, you're going to have the date when the siege begins. So in chapter 24, again, in the ninth year, in the 10th month, in the 10th day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, write thee the name of this day, even this day. Um, there, for some reason, I'm going to have this delay. Don't know why. It's all working, but there's a delay that I'm getting in my sharing. So I'm not sure why that is. Um, hopefully people can hear me fine, that uh, everything's working okay. Somebody just tell me everything's working okay, if I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. When I share, I can't go over to my screen. 
Okay, thanks. So um, in chapter 24, it says, write the name of this day, even this same day, the king of Babylon set himself against Jerusalem the same day. So if we take into account that Ezekiel is in Babylon, but King Nebuchadnezzar is in Jerusalem 500 miles away, on the very day that the siege begins, an angel comes to Ezekiel and tells him that the siege has begun. So he now knows of the siege. And this is what he had been prophesying. So he'd been prophesying the siege. But we can see in a hidden way, he's also been prophesying the end of the siege. If you think about all the things that, you, that you've seen, the 10th day of the fifth month has shown up twice in our line, showed up at the end of 390 days, and it shows up here in Ezekiel 20. And so when the siege begins, there's a hint there that the siege is going to culminate in the events that are going to happen on the 10th day of the fifth month. Now, in, in trying to understand exactly when that's going to occur, um, Ezekiel's not necessarily telling us the exact year. We don't know how long that siege is going to be, per se. At least I haven't seen it uh, in Ezekiel. But we know ultimately that it ends up being a year and a half. And it can be inferred that it's the period of the kings of Judah, um, obviously, are going to end there. So that 391.5, we can now look back and see it. But I don't know if Ezekiel could see that it was going to be 391.5 for the kings of Judah. Um, but there are other things that, you know, obviously a siege isn't going to carry on much longer than that. A two and a half year siege would be kind of insane, though. There have been sieges that have been a lot longer than that in, in areas where uh, they couldn't completely cut off the supplies to a city. But normally a city, uh, when you have a siege, uh, and, and, the, and you notice when the siege begins here, it begins on the 10th day of the 10th month in the verse that we have here. So when you get that siege coming back over here, um, this is, they've, they have, they've planted their crops already. They're starting to plant their crops. So uh, they're not going to have a harvest here. So the army is going to end up harvesting those crops that were planted. Um, and so the people are going to be pretty hungry by the time you get to the next year on the 10th day of the fifth month. But of course, we know that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. So, you know, they didn't withstand uh, the battering rams uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's army anyway. Uh, but they obviously did suffer a famine, which you normally do in a siege. So anyway, we get to chapter 24. We see the siege has begun. Now, there is, there's some events that are going to happen further, and we, we're going to try to, to flesh those out a little bit. But to go back to that 10th day of the fifth month, um, I want to look at some verses in that chapter. So in chapter 20, uh, when I initially looked at this, I took the 20 from Ezekiel 20, and projected the 10th day of the fifth month into the year 2020. Now we were in the year 2018. This was on November, uh, November 2nd, 2018. On, on that Sabbath, I had, uh, it was actually, I, I think on, that was the, the third. But so it was on the second that I had started looking at this. And it was on the third, November 3rd, 2018, that I actually uh, presented this to Elder Jeff. So I went to his house and presented this to him. And I'd sort of been figuring it out that morning while I was at church, we shared it at Potluck, um, and then went to Joe, Elder Jeff's house with a group of people, and I presented um, these things. So, um, but initially when I had figured this out, uh, how would I put this? So I took the year 2020 because we're, we already had November 9th as a day. Unshare. Unshare, please. So we already had this as a date, November 9th. So um, I'm going to erase this down here. So this is the literal days. We, we've done with that. So we, we're in our history. And I'm over here 
uh, we had already figured out the 391.5 days going to November 9th and uh, 2019. And this is October 13th, 2018. So I'm just a, a few weeks later here, 21 days later, that I'm figuring this stuff out. Uh, it actually did it in stages. So I actually think it was even before November 3rd. I think November 3rd was when I worked Revelation in. I'm, I have to look back at those meetings, try to figure out where I presented things. Uh, but by November 3rd, I had nailed down a uh, July 18th. And I believe that was the one on November 3rd, I presented it to Elder Jeff, I'm pretty sure. And the next day, um, he presented it, either the next day or the day after that, on November 5th. So and I have to look at those dates. So, uh, so November 3rd, I think it is. Anyway, kind of belaboring this a little bit. So we have November 9th. So I'm here and I'm looking at the next event that's going to happen. So we had marked this as midnight. And I'm then saying, well, I need to look at something in the future. And I take in this symbol because I see that this is the prophecy of Ezekiel, right? 391.5. So that leads up to here. So now I want to look past that event. And so I just look at the next year. So I'm saying I want to look at the 10th day of the fifth month in 2020. That's all I was doing. And I wanted to know what date it was. So when I looked up the 10th day of the fifth month, I noticed it was July 18th. So this part I had presented to Jeff earlier. So it's when I finally nailed down everything, I believe is when he presented it. But I, I'm still trying to remember. I have to go back and look over that history myself. So I think uh, what's that? what I am. What I remember, you have been talking about it in early at October, about the uh, July 18th. The, the, uh, yeah, about Ezekiel chapter 20, verse yeah. 1, and tying it in. And then um, we initially were looking at the July 31st. Right. Because that's the that Julian date you have there. Yes. So this is the Julian date. And originally I had July 31st. So thanks for that, Stephen. And, and you uh, sent me an email and told me later when we got the Gregorian date that it was 252 days to the Gregorian date. But here, originally I was using July 31st on the Gregorian, but I was still using July 18th, Julian. So this is, so I looked at July 18th, Julian, and that's the 10th day of the fifth month. And so what I'm going to try to do is go back what I first presented about July 18th before I worked in Revelation or Revelation 9. So just from Ezekiel, this is what I saw. So I saw July 18th, Julian was the 10th day of the fifth month. But the date that I looked at on our calendar was July 31st. Now, what ended up happening is I knew that these were Julian dates that I'm dealing with in, in, in this history. So July 21st is a Julian date. Uh, when I had the, the literal days, August 15th is a Julian date. And so from this history, I took the Julian dates and I took the 10th day of the fifth month and I looked at the Julian date of July 18th. Now I already stood, understood July 18th from different places. So I understood it from Samuel Snow's letters. So Sh Samuel Sheffield Snow's letters that it was the last letter was published July 18th, three days before midnight. So I understood this date. I also understood that the 187 from the first day of the first month, so I understood that symbol. And I also understood uh, from Ezekiel's prophecy, July 18th was 1449 on the Julian calendar that was July 27th on the Gregorian for the 26th day of the fourth month. So I at least had three different uh, places that I already understood July 18th as a symbol. So when I looked at the 10th day of the fifth month and I saw July 18th as a symbol, I actually matched it up with Samuel Snow's letters. So I hope I have enough room to do this. I think I do. So what I did is I drew a line. And in this line, I, I put 
our line. That is, I took um, the line of what had happened here, which is a little more involved than just this, because we had over here, June 9th, 2018, this is the, the camp meeting at, at Italy, the second camp meeting. And we had uh, July 27th. So that, of course, comes from Josiah Lich's prophecy. And we had July 27th. And uh, Daniel from Brazil was predicting October 13th based on 126 days, which he was counting from July 10th. Ordinally, Sustain was counting from June 9th, cardinally. And this is when he closed the Sabbath, Elder Jeff closed the Sabbath. And so I had this July 27th. And so I saw this as a symbol of Islam. And of course, this is a symbol of Ezekiel's prophecy, but I could also relate it to Islam because of the 391. And this chiasm here has August 11th as the center of it. Now, I could also look at August 11th over here as a Julian date. And the Julian date's going to follow 13 days after. Now, it gets a little complicated because uh, I was counting cardinally and Daniel was counting ordinally, but that became providential in understanding this puzzle. So what I did is I looked at Samuel Snow's letters and I put July 18th, 1844 here. And... I counted the number of days going back in his, his line, and I think I actually put July 18th, I'm trying to remember. I, I haven't done this since then. Um, but we have Samuel Snow's letters. So in Samuel Snow's letters, you have July 18th. You also have June 22nd. And I'm trying to remember how this all worked out. I know these two laid out. And we also had here his first letter is February 16th. So we're going to go over this a bit more in detail. Uh, the point is that we know that the center of this chiasm, um, he had a chiasm that went from February 16th to July 18th. And that chiasm had May 2nd as the center. But we didn't realize that there was a chiasm here between February 16th and June 22nd. Now, we also know that I initially took six days out of this, and I made a period of 120 days. Now, if you line up Samuel Snow's letters, February 22nd is six days after June 9th. And then... From here to here is 120 days from February 22nd to June 22nd. The center of this line is April 19th. The first day of the first month becomes the center of this chiasm. So this becomes 63 days and 63 days. But also the center of, uh, of, of Samuel Snow's letters was May 2nd. Um, if you count April 19th, you go 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. It's 13 days apart. So this is also May 2nd here in, in, the, in these letters. But if I go up here, I could mark this as August 11th Julian, because August 11th Julian follows 13 days later. So what I ended up doing is I ended up laying out this chiasm here, but this line was Samuel Snow's letters. And so for the first time, we realized that Samuel Snow's letters had this other chiasm in it with April 19th as the center of it. But this was came about by comparing July 18th from Samuel Snow's letters to our history here. So I, I hope that makes sense. It's probably terribly done. Um, but this was very profound when it happened. So I remember I, when I noticed this, I, I was dumbfounded and I sat down in, in the chair. I just couldn't believe it. Now, Elder Jeff picked up on it right away. 
So he had been presenting Samuel Snow's letters uh, in, in 2018. He was presenting them at camp meetings. Uh, he saw they were very, very significant. So he was very familiar with them. And when he saw this, this line of July 18th fitting our history, but predicting July 18th, then he, he just said, this, this is definitely from God. And so he started to present uh, July 18th um, in some ways, at least supporting it. He later on ended up, once we got to Revelation 9, then that was it. You know, we knew we had July 18th. But he got sidetracked, and, and there's a whole history behind that, of uh, behind the scenes sort of trying to destroy this, this message. Uh, that some of you are familiar with some of the details, but there's a lot more than people know about. Um, so anyway, here, this part of Samuel Snow's letters lines up with this history here. And it also points to July 18th. So that's initially how I came to July 18th. So we, we rarely present Samuel Snow's letters in this message because most people still don't understand them. Um, but it's an important study. We might have some idea about it, but I think there's very few of us who have presented them um, to other people. Uh, and there, so we need to learn how to do that. We need to understand Samuel Snow's letters, uh, to read through them, to understand the symbolism of them. Um, so this here, of course, I have been figuring out this symbol of this Pentecost. Now, June 22nd, uh, Jeff has, has made it clear that this is a waymark in our history uh, connecting uh, different events in, in our movement, having to do with our camp meetings. And we can see that it lines up with October 13th in, in our history. October 13th here is June 22nd in Samuel Snow's letters as part of this chiasm or the structure. Now there's a lot more to the structure that I was developing, but since I basically got cut down at a certain point, a lot of that stuff that I had done, nobody, it's never been presented. And I'm probably the only one who understands it. So there's a lot more that goes in this history than what we see here. Now, um, so when you look from June 22nd to July 18th, this is a period of, uh, I believe, 25 days again. So this symbol here, uh, so you have nine plus, is it 25 days, nine plus, no, it's 27 days, I think. Eight. That's more than 25 days. 18 and eight. So that's 26 days, right? 26 days or 25 days. 23, 25. Yeah, 26 days. Anyway, this, this part is not as important, except that you could, you could still add this, 26 plus 390, uh, or put 360, 66, because of the leap year here, and you add those together, and you get 392. And in this history, see, I think actually I need to put this over here, because this is 391.5, but this is 392. So even though I get the July 18th there, this actually lines up with this here as far as the time is concerned. Right? So if you're going to line up these up, you would want to put this over here. But this starts a period uh, that's connected. This is midnight and the midnight crime. And this is the prediction before midnight, July 18th, Samuel Snow's letters, something that we've cast aside, but is actually very important as well to understand. Uh, because I still believe it's valid. The arguments that we made regarding the prediction before midnight, we no longer talk about it, uh, but it, it was actually fulfilled in our history. Um, but it was rejected uh, by Parminder because he, um, he could see where it was going, obviously. Um, but yet we fulfilled that, that prophecy. So it's something that was actually fulfilled. We actually had a prediction before midnight, before November 9th. And, and that prediction had was confirmed here on October 13th at noon. So this is originally how I came to, to understand July 18th. But the next step really came from 
um, understanding Samuel Snow's letters uh, and their connections. So this was a step here. So now I have the date, July 18th, 2020, and I look now at the book of Revelation. So I'm going to try to explain how it happened, how we came to understand this. So I'm going to get rid of Samuel Snow's letters here. Let's get those out of the way. Now, so here we have this, this history in this line, and we have this symbol of the 10th day of the fifth month. Now, we're, we're going to finish this off. And, and I'm not going to go into Revelation 9 yet. I want to finish off this history, but just show you initially how I looked at this. So I had, you know, we're nowhere going to eventually get to July 18th, 2020 on the Gregorian calendar, but there's some more important steps here dealing with the end of this. So this is what we're going to try to finish off. So we got about a half an hour to do this. So when we go back to Ezekiel, uh, 24. So we know the siege begins in Ezekiel 24. And when you get to, um, so he, God says a lot of things to him. There, there's so much detail here, and it, it's all important. Uh, but, you know, we're going to skip by some of these points. But on the 10th day of the 10th month, he has this vision where he's told that the siege has begun. And we find this from other places that that was the day the siege occurred. And then uh, verse 14, I, the Lord, have spoken it. It will come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. Neither will I spare. Neither will I repent according to thy ways and according to thy doings. Shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. So God says all these things that are going to happen which is basically the destruction of Jerusalem. And then he says, uh, in verse 15, it says, Also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee des the desire of thine eyes with a stroke, yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, bind the tire of thine head upon thee, and put on thy shoes upon thy feet and cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. And so I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. So, <clears throat> God is telling Ezekiel that his wife is going to die, because he's going to take away the desire of the eyes, which is their temple. And so God is going to take away the desire of his eyes, Ezekiel's eyes, which is his wife. So he's doing it again. An acted out prophecy, a pretty tragic one for him. And the people said unto me, Wilt thou not tell us what these things are to us, that thou doest so? And I answered them, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Speak unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord. Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pitieth. And your sons and your daughters, whom ye have left, fall by the sword. Now it's interesting here. Um, if you read this 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 phrase, "excellency of your strength," for those who've been going through the study on Leviticus twenty six, it's an exact phrase of "pride of your power." That's the first seven times, and in Ezekiel, this is under the fourth seven times. But in the fourth seven times, all of the first three seven times. Are combined and some people use this as an argument that when it says I shall break the pride of your power in Leviticus 26 that that's referring to the sanctuary which happens here under the fourth seven times the problem that you have there if you start with the destruction of the sanctuary in Leviticus 26 as the first event um, you have a real problem trying to explain explain what the next three events are because God doesn't start with the destruction of the sanctuary he starts with the captivity of Manasseh. So anyway, that's just an aside. So that's exact same Hebrew expression. So you could say, profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the desire of your eyes, and that which your soul pitieth, and your sons and your daughters, whom ye have left, fall by the sword. And ye shall do as I have done. Ye shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men, and your tires shall be upon your heads, and your shoes upon your feet. Ye shall not mourn, nor weep, 
but ye shall pine away for your iniquities and mourn one for another. Thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. According to all that I have done shall ye do. And when this cometh, ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Also thou, son of man, shall it not be in the day that I take from them their strength, the joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that whereupon they set their minds, their sons and their daughters, that he that escapeth in that day shall come unto thee to cause thee to hear it with thine ears. And in that day shall thy mouth be opened to him which is escaped, and thou shalt speak and be no more dumb, and thou shalt be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So we have this important detail here. I'm just going to move this over a bit. So Ezekiel is here. This is Ezekiel 24, verse 1. So it's 24, verse 1. And there's two prophecies. Can you stop sharing, please? Yes. Thank you. I should get better at that, but I'm not. Okay, so, uh, so we have Ezekiel 24, verse 1. Two prophecies are given. The first is that his wife is going to die. And that prophecy is fulfilled that day. So in trying to understand this, if we're going to compare this with our line, um, there's different ways that we can do it. And, and I'm not sure that we all fully understand the lines yet. Um, I'm not saying that like I understand them. I'm saying we just, there's things we don't quite understand. Um, but one of the things we see here, that there's a prophecy that's given that's fulfilled right here. But another prophecy is going to be fulfilled later. And that is Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And that Ezekiel, during this period, is not going to be prophesying against Israel. So when it says that he's dumb, I don't know that it literally means that he's not going to speak. Uh, he does write a whole bunch of prophecies here against um, uh, Edom, Moab, Ammon, Egypt, uh, Philistia. Uh, so he writes prophecies against the pagan nations in this period. And then he's going to, uh, again, prophesy against Israel. So we, we'll look at that. But here, this, his wife dying, I think is significant. Now, we know a woman represents a church. Now, in this case, the sanctuary is what Ezekiel is comparing. His, the death of his wife is being compared to the destruction of the sanctuary. And the sanctuary, of course, represents the church. And if you look at my, my initial application of this, July 31st is the 10th day of the fifth month. That's the destruction of the temple. And that's originally what I was predicting on July 18th. I wasn't predicting an attack by Islam because I hadn't initially, I mean, even though I saw all these symbols of Islam, um, I wasn't using them to predict uh, Islam per se, right? I was, there was going to be a destruction that was going to happen here. I mean, it was pretty obvious that I'd have to find Islam fitting into this as I continued to study. But this is where I established it first. So his wife dies. It's symbolizing what's going to happen here when the temple is destroyed. And so it's clear, though, when the temple is destroyed, he's not going to begin speaking until an escapee who has seen the destruction of the temple with his eyes comes and reports this to Ezekiel. So during this period of time, somebody's going to see the temple here being destroyed with their own eyes, and they're going to come to Ezekiel. Now, uh, a little point about this, if you don't understand the spring and the fall count, um, you can, if you make this a year and a half, this becomes also a year and a half, which is unrealistic that it's going to take a year and a half for somebody to see the destruction of the temple with their own eyes and finally show up at Ezekiel's doorstep. Um, it's much more realistic when you, when you consider the, that it's in the year of the captivity, and we're going to look at that, that that happens, that it's basically six months. So you're going to have six months from the destruction of the temple when that's going to be fulfilled, and we're going to see this here in Ezekiel 33, verse 17. 
So let's go there. And I'll try to remember to unshare my screen when I go back to the board. Now, Ezekiel 33 is really interesting. Um, the, obviously, we, we, we've come to accept that chapter numbers are not insignificant. Um, in the book of Numbers, uh, Numbers 3 and Numbers 33 are extremely important chapters. Um, they both relate uh, to this message. You know, Numbers 3 is where we get uh, the number 273 for the Levites. There's a whole bunch of things in there. And Numbers 33 is where the, the, the children of Israel in 1533 leave Egypt on the 15th day of the first month. And so there's a bunch of things in Numbers 33 uh, that relate to Numbers 3 as well. But when you look at Ezekiel 33, uh, Ezekiel 33 is basically a repeat of Ezekiel 3. So I'll just show you this here in Ezekiel 3. So Ezekiel 3, this is his first vision. And he talks about uh, the watchman. Uh, so he has to give this message, his head for it has to be harder than split flint. And in starting in verse 16, it came to pass at the end of seven days. And those seven days are symbolic days. They're not literal. That is, they're in vision and they have a symbolism to them. Uh, so, so that's as far as I'm going to go there. It's not actually, it doesn't actually use seven days in this period of time. But he says, son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them a warning from me. So you can go on and read that if you want. But when we go to chapter 33, um, it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring a sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for a watchman, if he seeth the sword come upon the land, he, land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. And whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. So it's, it's repeating the ideas of Ezekiel 3 in Ezekiel 33. Now, this, of course, is um, when this happens. Normally, when he's in a new vision, it'll tell you at the beginning of the chapter. Now, this is a new date. He's in a new vision. But he doesn't actually tell you this later that this actually had occurred. So this part of chapter 33, uh, he doesn't start with giving the date. He starts with prophesying. So he, he now is no longer dumb. He's now preaching back to the original message that he gave in Ezekiel chapter 1 to 7. So he's going to give that same message. That same message to him about warning is being given to him, and he's sharing that message. And then um, uh, when you get to verse... 17, uh, 21, when we get to verse 21. So he goes on and he talks about all these things. And it says that it came to pass in the 12th year of the captivity. So one of the things we know is that Zedekiah reigned for 11 years. And in the 11th year of his reign, in the ninth day of the fourth month, he was killed. The walls of Jerusalem were broken down. And so now when we, we, we come here to um, Ezekiel 33, 21, it says in the 12th year of our captivity. So this is not referring to the years of Zedekiah's reign. It's referring to a fall to fall calendar. If you tried to count this in the context of the 12th year, you would actually put, have to add an extra year on the, on the, on the I'd have to add an extra year from the date of the destruction of the temple because if it's destroyed in the ninth year, and you're counting the rains spring to spring, maybe I'll show people this. So, so if you're in the ninth year, so remember, spring to spring, you got 12 months. It starts on the first month. It starts on the first day of the first month. Right, so you got these here. And we know that the temple was destroyed here in the ninth day of the fourth month, so back here, or not the temple, but this, the walls were broken down, Zedekiah is killed. And now, 
if, so if this is spring to spring, the 10th day of the 10th month in the 12th year, so this is the 11th year, if this is the 12th year, then you're going to be way over here. This is going to be about a year and a half. But if you're counting spring to spring, your first month is still going to be here, but the year doesn't start until the fall. So when the temple is destroyed here, so this is, this is not our years, these are the years of the reigns of, of, of the king, you would then have the king's reign be here. So I guess I could keep the 11 and the 12 up there. But we know that it's in the 11th year that the city is destroyed. So his year would again become the years of the captivity are going to the fall. So when we talk about the 12th year of the captivity, it's going to be here. And this is still the first month. So the 10th month is over here. So that's only a, a half of a year between it. So if you don't recognize that there's two different calendars, you're either going to have two and a half years for the siege and six months for the escapee to return, or a year and a half for the siege and a year and a half for the escapee to come and, and tell Ezekiel. So this is why the two calendars become important. One of the reasons, uh, it, it makes way more sense. So it would take uh, an escapee, somebody who's escaped, he can't, he, he can't maybe get there in four months uh, like you could normally. Uh, he's gonna obviously have to travel and he's traveling at a time of the year that's a little bit tough. So I think he gets to Ezekiel as fast as he possibly can. And that would be about six months. Uh, if it's a year and a half, it makes no sense. Uh, that he's going to have the first person come and report to him that he saw uh, the temple being destroyed. So, so that's the that's the point I think that uh, you know we would have from that chronology point. So we can see now though he has this his wife dies, and that is of course a um, an important detail. This prophecy of his wife dying is predicting this event. But what does the escapee represent? And if we try to put it into our lines, if we take Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, we also have an es es the escapes, the ones that have escaped from the hands of the papacy. Um, and it's interesting in the history, prior to the giving of the prophecy of the escapee, he's prophesying to Edom, Am Ammon, Moab, Philistia, Egypt, these pagan nations, and, and they also are symbolized in the escapee. So, so there's something there, some details there that we have not uh, fully understood. Um, and and that's, that's why I think this is important. But we have not really dug into this part of Ezekiel yet. Now, I remember when this was first presented um, in uh, Arkansas back in 2016. So I think it was uh, July 16th. 2016 that this was presented. Um, and Elder Jeff made DVDs of the presentation and started sharing them around. Every time we started getting new light, not just you know from these types of things, but even when Jeff was going on the right track, we'd have things come in and distract us, get us off track. And, and that's what started happening in 2016. We again had a, an apostasy like we had in 2014. And again, you know, we've had these a number of times where uh, we're getting on track and something comes to, to, to distract us. Even happened in 2010 uh, with the prophetic chain. Uh, that's uh, when that was presented, that never got completed. Elder Jeff presented that in Oklahoma in 2010 in November. And uh, um, things started to fall apart from that point. So whenever there was this, this new light, things that we were supposed to look at, Satan came in to distract us. So. So there is stuff here that maybe, maybe it's not relevant yet. Maybe that's why we haven't fully understood it. Uh, but I think we do need to understand it as we move forward. So one of the things um, I encourage people to do is to look over some of these older uh, presentations. And we're, we're, you know, we're, we definitely need to understand them better than we do. So just to sort of finish this off, finish off this uh, chapter here. So when it comes in the 12th year of their captivity in the 10th month and the fifth day of the month, 
Now, one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. And then he says, Now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening afore that he had escaped came. And he opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning, and my mouth was opened, and I was no more dumb. So he says, he opened, his mouth was open that evening before. So the first part of Ezekiel 33 is his mouth being opened before this, the escapee comes. And then when the escapee comes, he's telling you, yes, my mouth was open the evening before. So, so, this, is the, um, you know, so this is the main point here when we look at this, this passage. Um, it's, it's, we can see that the first part of 33 happens on the same day. And it's one of those arguments I use against uh, lunar Sabbatarians who try to say that the day starts in the morning because he's told that his tongue would be open on the day that the escapee comes, but it actually happens on the evening before, which is still the same day because the day starts at evening. That's sort of an aside. Um, so this, this can all be read through. Um, can't remember if there's any other details here that I need to bring out, but probably that would be it uh, as far as the escapee is concerned. And if we go back to uh, chapter uh, 24, right? Remember we had that prophecy that his tongue would be, uh, that he would be made dumb and his tongue is loosed when the escapee comes. And I just wanted to show you this in, in Ezekiel 25, prophecy against Ammon, prophecy against Moab, prophecy against Edom, so that's Edom, Moab, and Ammon, prophecy against Philistia, so the Philistines, prophecy against Tyre, that's another important one, I knew I was forgetting one of them, so the prophecies against Tyre, and then the prophecies, uh, the lament for Tyre, and then the prophecy against Egypt, in chapter 29, um, and then the lament for Egypt, and then all this stuff dealing with Egypt, and it's in Ezekiel, uh, one of these here in Ezekiel 32, I think, where you get the first day of the first month. Uh, it might be 31. So he's going to have a date in one of these uh, chapters where it happens on the first day of the first month. I don't see it here, but it's in there. Maybe 30. I think it's uh, 29 verse 17. Okay, 29. It's even earlier. 29 verse 17. And it came to pass in the seventh and twentieth year in the first day of the month, in the first day, in the first month, in the first day of the month. And it's interesting here in this passage. Um, that it says in the 20 and 70th year. And now, of course, it doesn't matter if it's in the first six months uh, when you're counting spring to spring or fall to fall. But the point is, Zedekiah, he, um, you know, he died in the 11th year of his reign. So if you talk about the 12th year, now it's clear that he talks in 33, he says in the 12th year of the captivity, because it's, it's on the 10th day of the 10th month, or not the 10th, the 5th day of the 10th month that the escapee comes uh, to see him. Uh, so it's important that he mentioned that it's in the year of the captivity, but not absolutely necessary, uh, because maybe some people could think that, well, it's the 12th year of Zedekiah, but it's not. But also, in these, this, second, this section here, where you have a date that's after long after, 27 years, uh, so it's like 16 years after Zedekiah was killed, he doesn't have to mention it's in the year in the captivity because it's on the first day of the first month. But I also argue there are some other dates here uh, that happen uh, after the death of Zedekiah that, that you could argue that they're all in the year of the captivity, but you're not going to count them in the year of Zedekiah because he's no longer king, but he mentions them specifically uh, when they're important to do so. So, so we have these these prophecy. We have this escapee, and just to kind of finish it up, I just want to uh, 
make sure you understand what I'm talking about. I'm sure most of you do. But if you go to Daniel 11 and you go uh, to 40 to 45, we have in verse 42, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And before that, he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So to me, this, this has to be a reference back to Ezekiel, uh, 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 that section between uh, chapter 25 and onward, where you have the section of, uh, talking about these, these pagan nations. Where they, and this escapee also symbolizes that. So that that's tied together because when the escapee comes, then he can now prophesy against Israel again. So while that, till that escapee comes, he's dumb in regarding Israel. And I, so I think there's an application there. I'm not making the application specifically to say what I think that means in the future. Um, I will in some other places. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the way I see it. Those are the details. And what we will do next time is we'll start to look at Revelation 9. And, and as, as we go through Revelation 9, well, we're going to continue to come back to Samuel Snow's letters because they become very relevant as well when we get to Millerite history. Um, I might even do just at some point a whole presentation on Samuel Snow's letters. In this, if you're reading the overview of July 18th, 2020, I do a bit of a presentation for people. It's, it's obviously, I feel it's insufficient for somebody to really understand them, but we do need to understand them, especially if we're sharing this with other people. So using the symbols like midnight and the midnight cry in Ezekiel's prophecy, and we don't know uh, Millerite history, it's not going to be very useful for people. And knowing July 18th, from Millerite history is also important. So any final questions? I know this one I said, tended to talk a lot more except for people telling me to, uh, to go back to the whiteboard to stop sharing. But uh, any, anything that somebody would like to bring out or, or have a question, remember you can always email with me with questions. Um, I don't have any specific things here. Um, there's some stuff which I'm not going to address here. We got to look at that. Um, dealing with the Pope, some day of the week, and, and so forth. But um, any any final thoughts from anyone? If not, we can close with prayer, and then we can say our goodbyes. Okay, so let's kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study that we had here today. Many things, that, so many details that we looked at, I don't think we can remember them all. But, Lord, I ask that we can uh, continue to study. Help us to find a way to share this simply with others. I know that uh, Ezekiel's wheels within wheels look confusing at first. Um, but Ellen White says they have perfect order. And, uh, Lord, we know that there's a perfect order in the things that you have revealed to us. So we thank you. Uh, we ask that you can be with us throughout the rest of our, our day, for those that still have a rest of the day, and for those that are going to bed, we ask that you can give them a good rest. Help us also uh, tomorrow, which we prepare for the Sabbath, and uh, for the various uh, work that you're doing it, that you're going to do in our lives as we, as we continue to study and fellowship together through the internet. And so we ask, Lord, that you can continue to teach us and transform us to be like Christ. And we pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to stop the recording.
but we 